It's a pleasure to, to be back in Iowa. Uh, I've been here a couple times and evidently I haven't done a good enough job because they keep asking me to come back, you know. And uh, uh, we've been no-tilling since 1971, have been using cover crops since 1978, and uh, I guess this picture, or one like it, this is why everybody wants me to talk, because we grow big radishes, as you can see. And uh, this is just one of our fields on our farm that uh, uh, we've used these cover crops in. Uh, five years ago, we started using blended covers, and I really liked Jay's presentation this morning because he, he told you why we should use them. I was never told that. We just found out that it worked and we kept trying it, you know. But now I understand how we can change the soil and do things. Because we started in 71 with only one thing in mind. It didn't cost as much to plant no-till corn as it did conventional corn. I wasn't concerned about erosion. I wasn't concerned about anything else. It was what it cost me, you know. Five years ago, we stumbled onto an eight-way blend using sunflowers. And the rewards have been that we have a lot of elderly single lady landowners that have other operators. And right now we have three of those farms we've just taken over because they want sunflowers on their farm. So we've been able to rent some extra ground, you know. A uh, little bit about our farm, it's a picture of it. Uh, Uh, right here in the center, this is a 45 acre, 41 acre field. And I just wanted to show you these are different blends that we were using uh, in, after wheat. Uh, these happen to be two soybean fields. Uh, and we are in uh, CSP that helps pay some of the, that's the only funding we've ever had from government because we were always uh, one step ahead of what they thought we ought to get paid for, you know. We've never been fortunate enough to get paid to use cover crops. Whoops. I'm going to go back just a little bit. Uh, when we started in 1971, everybody laughed. They said, well, it takes a lot of horsepower. You can't pull a no-till corn planter with a 40-horse tractor. And that's what we had. Uh, I worked with the Amish a lot, so I put this picture up when I go out to talk to guys to sell them. You know, a two-row planter takes four horses. So if you want a four row planter, it's gonna take six. It's no big deal, you know. They're easy to pull. Uh, the Amish really liked it. Uh, no matter if we actually make these planters for the Amish, we buy old Alice Chalmers planters, cut them down to two rows, take them up there and triple our money. And it's a side thing we can do in the winter time, you know. Uh, I throw this picture in. This happened to be our first no-till drill. You know, but I really wanted to throw this in to show you the terrain that we farm. It's like here, it's rough. You know, we farm from 20% slopes down to zero. Uh, but this is what we started with. And just imagine about the air seeders and the 12 and 24 row planters we're using today. How easy it is now to no-till compared to what it was when we started. The first thing I'd like to talk to you about is before you go to no-till, you need to understand how to spread your residue, how to manage what comes out behind your machine. It makes no difference what color it is. You need to spread the residue uniformly. And it can be done. You know, it's a little tough with a 45-foot draper header. But if you change the hydraulic hose going to the hydraulic spinners or to the hydraulic uh, chopper things, it will throw it that far. You can make some changes. Here I wanted to show you, this is 200 bushel corn. Uh, you can barely see the, uh, the uh, cover crop coming underneath here, but I wanted to show you how uniform and uh, uh, even the uh, corn fodder was being spread behind the combine. This is our neighbor's farm. He's a no-tiller. Don't use cover crops. But for some reason, his straw chopper quit working a year ago. So he just spread everything 
in a 40 inch band. During the winter time, he's out there with a brush hog. Early in the spring, he took his colder caddy off his drill and was out there running around with it, you know. He had all kinds of problems because this was dry, this was wet, there was insects in here, you know, and he's just, you know, he just didn't understand how important it was to manage that residue. Here's that field with that residue in it. You can see even the soybeans wouldn't grow there. And that is 40 inches wide every 30 foot. And in this field, it cost him 13 bushel of beans by not spreading the residue evenly. Before you begin to no-till, get these things accomplished because it makes it so much easier to make your cover crops and your no-till work a lot better. I like to start to talk about rye because if, it's a, if you're conventional farmers, you're used to brown. You're not used to green. I like to plant everything green because Ohio's weatherman gets paid way too much money and he's always wrong, <laughs> you know? If he says it's not gonna rain, it's gonna rain. If it's raining, it won't stop, you know? So we have to have something green and growing because we have a lot of clay in our soils. We have to utilize the rye to grow out the moisture. We operate 1,400 acres. Out of that, we own about 100. And it's almost impractical to put 500 to $1,000 an acre in rented ground to put tile in it. So in order for us to dry it out, we use a rye. So this rye was sowed in the fall. It doesn't really matter to me how you get it out there. This happened to be the easiest thing we can do. This was spread with the fertilizer spreader the fall before at uh, 50 pounds of the acre and 50 pounds of potash in order to have enough spacing in the gate of the spreader to spread it right, you know. I like to no-till it, but when you're combining beans and shelling corn, there ain't nobody left to run a drill. You know, uh, so we do it however we can get it out there. Uh, one thing we do notice is usually, in, that was an April 24th picture, this is a May 27th picture. If you'll notice, it does come out of control. You know, and what, you know, here I am, best place I can be, outstanding in my field, wondering what I'm going to do with this mess. You know, guess what, guys? When it's like this, it's a piece of cake. You just pull the planter and the drill, mash it down with a cauldron packer or a roller, save a herbicide pass, seven to 12 days, maybe as much as two weeks, uh, the rye will die. I don't know why that's coming up there. There you go, okay. Uh, but we can plant right into that. And here we're showing you how it works, you know? Here we're planting into five foot tall rye. You know, you might see a little place right here in the corner of this picture. That's a 90 foot strip that didn't have any rye in it. The reason I did that was it's like a test plot. We want to see if the rye makes any difference in the soybean yield. This field of rye was never sprayed after we planted the beans. That 90 foot strip was sprayed four times because of mare's tail. The beans in the 90 foot strip made 45, these made 72 this fall. Just to show you that it works well, we come back in with a crop roller and uh, roll the rye down. Uh, here you can see the soybeans emerging through the rye cover. You know, uh, it looks like a mess. Takes less fuel to pull the planter because you're not having any slippage problems. The drill stays the same depth. Here's a month later on the soybean, and then here it is in June. You know, no problem to harvest the beans because the rye will go down to the ground. If you'll notice the color of the beans, look how dark green they are. We found on our farm, we no longer have sudden death. We no longer have white mold. We no longer have mare's tail problems. We no longer have fall uh, annual weed problems. We no longer have giant ragweed problems because the rye suppresses it. You know, the armor on the soil is what we want to see. Jay talked about that. This armor protects our soil. If you look how dark green these beans are, 
When a rain droplet hits this, it doesn't splash the soil up on the beans. It doesn't put that soil bacteria on the stems and the leaves that causes a disease for the soybeans. You know, these are 15 inch row beans. Uh, just another shot, this is a 20% slope, just to show you that we have eliminated erosion off our farm. In 1970, when we started no-tilling, we were losing 25 ton of soil per acre. This year, in the past five years, we've not lost more than 100 pounds per acre. That's quite a savings in soil loss. <clears throat> this was uh, a neighbor's field. Right here, uh, this is a fence row. These are, this was had annual ryegrass that we burnt down early and planted the soybeans. These are 15 inch row beans here. These are 15 inch row beans planted the same day. The only difference, one come out of a white planter, one come out of a Kinsey planter, same variety of beans. We went through the season. My neighbor sprayed his beans four times. We had one shot of Roundup on it to get rid of the ryegrass. This beans made 52 bushel, these were 74. I must say that our neighbor took a hint, he now has 550 acres of rye that he's going to plant beans into next year. I felt really good about that. You know. Can we get soybeans? Yes. Look at the beans on our stems. What we see with our soybeans in the rye, I think the rye ties up the nitrogen in the soil. So the beans are hungry for nitrogen. That means they set more pods, they set more nodes, and they set them closer together. Instead of two nodes with two pods, we'll have three to five per set. That's why we can have a seven to 12 bushel yield increase where we're using rye versus no rye in the rotation. And here's the results. I think everybody would like to have a field of beans that look like this, with no herbicides. You know, we can still make some money at the seven dollar beans or eight dollar beans, you know, without using herbicides or herbicide or uh, fertilizer. We're going to change gears a little bit and talk about some single species we worked with for 30 years because no one ever told me we could put two species together and make them grow. You know, it took me a long time to learn that lesson, you know. But we like to start with Harry Vetch, and I really like Harry Vetch. You can see it's a nice ground cover. This is 12 pound per acre sowed after wheat harvest. I believe in a three year rotation. A lot of you probably don't, but I think I can give you a 4% boost in your yield in corn and soybeans if you put wheat in your rotation. That's a proven fact from all universities if you ask them. If you ask your agronomist, if I go from a two year rotation to a three, will I have a yield bump? And he'll probably tell you yes, because he knows that's what will happen. That's just spreading out the diversity a little more. But here we are planting into this, you know, it's a lot of fun. There's no dust, there's no dirt, it pulls easy. And when you run over it, it will die. You know, it will die. Here's the planter, look at that. You see no soil being exposed. This equals 200 pounds of nitrogen for this year's corn crop. Pretty economical. The hairy vetch costs 24 bucks an acre. Oshawinter pea is our next nitrogen source. We'd like to keep our hairy vetch on the top of the knob. We put our Austrian winter peas on the slopes and down in the flatland. You know, because it just does a lot better. This is 30 pound of, of uh, peas and that's about $21. Almost the same cost as a hairy vetch, you know. What I really like about the, the Austrian winter pea is that we have nodulation at the two inch level. We have nodulation at the four to five inch level. And we have nodulation at the nine to 10 inch level. Why is that important? When I plant my corn and the first root comes out and it runs into one of these nodulations right here, it's got organic nitrogen. It's got nitrogen to turn that corn dark green. When it's knee high and we're thinking about side dressing, right there, four inches deep, there's where all my roots are. In August, 
when it's already decided how much it's going to yield, but hasn't determined the test weight, the long roots get down here and we increase the test weight. Where we have a legume crop growing in a field, our test weight corn is normally two pounds higher than where we're using lots of bought nitrogen. We've run a lot of tests and so we find that time after time that our organic end from our cover crops will make the test weight of the corn a lot heavier. Just throw this in, this is a 14 inch tile spade. This is 14 inches deep. We have nodulation at the six inch level and that's my topsoil right there. We have it at the nine inch level and there's 14 inches deep. This plant was planted on eight one. That's a month and two, five days. That's how much that plant's grown. You cannot spread urea out of a spreader any more even than you can right there. In 1971, this was our soil. This is Cardington clay-based soil. It's 45% clay. This is what it looks like today, 40 years later. When I started in 1971, this was a half percent organic matter. Today, this is 7.5. When I started in 71, this would hold an inch and three quarters of water in the profile. Today, this holds 21 inches of water through the profile. That's how important organic matter is. Jay showed you that for every point of organic matter, you pick up about 1,000 pounds of nitrogen. Only about 10% of that's available to the plant. So if I picked up 700 pounds of nitrogen, only 10% of that's available, there's 70 pounds of nitrogen I can credit to my next year's corn without having anything there. But when I have a cover crop in there that's supplying nodulation, you know, like here and here, and we have fungi like we have right here and up here, we don't have to buy nitrogen for our corn. Now, it don't happen overnight, guys. It takes a little bit of time. It takes management, you know. If you don't want to manage, if you don't want to make money, just keep doing conventional stuff. You'll make out, you know. Uh, this is my earthworms. Uh, this was one of our problem childs. This is uh, green fixed chickling vetch. Uh, I thought it was going to be the greatest thing we ever tried. It was probably our biggest disaster. Mainly because I say if you look right down here, you'll see white blooms, a few purple blooms. If you look at the roots after it's bloomed, there's no nodulation. Where did the nitrogen go? It went to build the seed. It moved the nitrogen from the roots to the seeds. Now my earthworm likes it. You know, that's my chisel plow and everything, you know. But we don't want our cover crops to bloom. We want the roots to hold all the nutrients they can hold. We like buckwheat. Buckwheat is a great soil loosener on the surface. Roots are about three inches deep. Lots of fibrous roots. What we found by using buckwheat in our rotation, it blooms after 30 days. So that means that we have a warm spring and we have a farm that's got lots of compaction on the surface. We can plant buckwheat in it and 30 days later we can plant corn in it because it's done its deal. If you get greedy like I am, I call the beekeepers and I charge them 30 bucks a hive and put five to 10 hives per acre. You know, I don't need to plant corn. You know, that's 300 bucks. And I still got time to do something else. Or we can make a lot of pancakes after we harvest the buckwheat, you know. <laughs> this is a new one we're trying. I like it real well. It's really a difficult plant to establish. Uh, we've been a failure at it for five years up till last fall. This is Priscilla. It comes out of France. It's a cool season plant. We're trying to plant it in August when the soil is 90, 100 degrees and it would never grow. It would never sprout, it wouldn't do anything. We found if we planted the first day of September when the soil cooled off down to about 70, maybe down to 82, it done real well. But the interesting thing 
that one plant right there, if you dug all the roots from that one plant, a month after it come up, and just as it's starting to bloom, all the roots will more than fill a five gallon bucket. If you talk about a plant that loosens the top eight or 10 inches of soil, it's really great, you know? The disadvantage of it is, it's eight bucks a pound. So that's one pound per acre, guys. There's a million three hundred thousand seeds in Brazil. You don't need very much, you know. This is our planter. We bought this in '97. Uh, uh, this happened to be an eight-row with seven splitters. Uh, we really like it real well. It performs real well. And the reason it made us kind of famous was this is a soybean plate with our Austin winter peas. It'll plant all kind of round seeds, so it doesn't have to be peas. It could be anything else that's round. It'll go through it. But what made it real nice, we could put reddishes beside it. And this happens to be a sugar beet plate that we discovered to work. We're planting two species, two different sizes. And we have a good stand of things that we want to have. And this is the stand we get. We get reddishes, individual seeds, planted four and a half inches apart. And our winter peas are two and a half inches apart. So we end up with about 14 pounds of winter peas, almost a pound of reddishes. And we have something that looks like this. Our reddishes become our storage tanks for nutrients. You can see these are about 14, 15 inches deep in the soil. Then we have a tap root that goes on. And when they're like this, they store lots of nutrients. And I'll show you that in just a minute. What we found, and this is where we started learning that we could do things more than one species. In 97, we learned how this happened. You saw the nodulation from our Austin winter pea earlier. But look at the nodulation of this winter pea that was 15 inches away from this reddish, and they're twice as big. We did a lot of research on this. They're twice as big, and there's 25% mod more nitrogen fixing nodules here on this plant than there is when it's by itself. And when we put the reddish by itself, it never got this big a tuber. This tuber from right there to right there is 22 inches long in the soil. There's nobody here that can pull a deep ripper 22 inches deep because you ain't got enough horsepower. You know, those are my deep rippers. What it does as it grows, the reddishes lift the soil, lifts the soil three to four inches. Just look how that reddish is working. Look what it's doing for us. It enhances soil activity. It enhances how much water the soil can hold and do those kind of things. Look at this reddish. The neat thing is, and when you're greedy like I am, and you have a lot of Samoans, and a lot of Chinese, and a lot of Vietnamese people in, in Columbus, they come and dig them. And they pay you $2.50 a piece for them. And I don't have to bend over, you know? Now the rule is that they only take one and leave three which I still have three and a foot, or two and a foot, you know. We're still doing a thing. But every year we get about 2,000 bucks for these guys that want to come and dig some daikon radishes. The neat thing that we found out was that they winter kill. The winter peas will winter kill also if they get above knee high. Most of the peas are four foot tall, it's planted in August. So we have the winter pea row dead, we have the reddishes dead, you know. We have a little volunteer wheat here, I guess because we have one of those silver cedars instead of a green one, but maybe one of these days will change, you know. Uh, here's the corn plant coming up. Here's the reddish. You really can't see it, but right there's a ladybug. What we have done, we have increased the biological activity of our soil, which increases the beneficial insects. So we no longer have to worry about cutworm, armyworm, slugs, those kind of things, you know. You saw that reddish, how it lifted the soil? You can see here how it's lifted the soil. This is a strip-till machine. 
This is my deep river, and I don't know how many quarts of water will go in them holes, you know, when it rains. And we still have adequate cover to protect the soil, you know. Again, I like green covers. When you see this in November and December, you find a green field, I just get ecstatic. I flew from St. Paul to Des Moines. I saw one green field and it was a golf course. You know, we gotta do better. We gotta do better. We've tried some other things. This is sun hemp. You know, you go to meetings like this and somebody will say something to you and the light bulb goes off and I was at a meeting and this guy was standing up from Africa talking and he was talking about this plant that grows 25 foot tall has nodules the size of golf balls. And I said, man, I gotta have that one, <laughs> you know? So I got together with him and he says, I'll send you some. And I said, fine. And he says, you wanna pay the freight? Well, I said, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll pay the freight. Wasn't thinking very much, <laughs> you know? I think the sun hip was $3 a pound and the freight was $58 a pound, <laughs> you know? But we got something to try. But there it is, you know, it looks real good. It went through the planter well. At 34 degree afternoon, it all died. I thought that was good. But the thing I really noticed, and you notice this stuff when you're no-tilling and trying to figure out what's going on, look how green that reddish row is. Look how tall them reddishes are in there. Reddishes never got that tall in my winter pea field because the winter peas tend to fall over. So what we found here was these reddishes went two inches deeper where we had sun hemp in the soil. You know, so that was a plus, you know. Here was a disaster, you know. This is fava bean, really good friend of mine, Steve Groff out of Pennsylvania. He says, David, he says, we got the hottest cover crop you've ever seen. We're going to start marketing it under Cover Crop Solutions name. And he says, it's fava beans. It's got big nodules, looks good. Will work well in the split rows. Put it in there. Was sorely disappointed. Had no nitrogen because it didn't have a long enough growing season because it come, it came from Mexico. But we learned. But what I wanted to show you here was this reddish right here. This reddish is five and a half inches in diameter, fourteen and a half inches out of the ground. Now you're going to tell me there's no root in the soil. Well, we dug that reddish. At nine inches deep, it hit a plow soil. It was two inches thick. The tap root broke through the plow sole. It was an inch in diameter going through the plow sole. And 11 inches below the plow sole, it got three inches in diameter again before the frost killed it. You know? So Dave Brandt University came up with a theory. In order words to get your reddish to get through the hard pan, it had to grow out of the ground. Had to get enough weight to push it through. You know? Whether it's right or not, but they're all big, but they all seem to break through the hard pan. When did you, you plant know. that radish? That radish was planted on uh, July the 25th, after wheat. And this was a November picture. Can you fly them on? Uh, you can. It's not quite as success successful unless it rains after you fly them on. So you can get the soil damp. They really need to have a little bit of ground cover. A little bit of soil on them. And the reason I called it my storage, mini storage tanks Look at the information. Look at the information. This is a five-year study done by the Ohio, State, the Ohio State University of five fields in five years, five fields every year for five years. And this was the average nutrients found the day we were planting corn. So this is what was available to our corn plants the year we was planting corn. We're running 107 to 110 day corn. I guess what I'm getting at, if I have 250 pounds of nitrogen available, 23 phosphorus, 230 pounds of potash, sulfur, calcium, 150 pounds of calcium, and magnesium, does Dave Brandt need to buy fertilizer to produce 200 bushel corn, which I can't produce. About 170 is the best we can do. We just don't have ground that will produce 200 bushel corn, but I like to use 200 bushel as an average. So this taught me a lesson. 
for the last three years, we've not used any fertilizer where we've had peas and radishes and cover crops. Uh, this is a chart that we used to go along with that. This is five years of no-till with one year of cover crop. This is five years of no-till. Does cover crop loosen the soil? If we look at 15 inches deep, for an example, it took 100 pounds of pressure to push a probe in the ground where we had cover. If we had no cover at 15 inches deep, it took almost 200 pounds. I would say our cover crop loosened the soil. You know? How do we know how much nitrogen is there? This is a spad meter, which is the same as a green seeker. It checks the chlorophyll in the leaf. Whatever number you come up with corresponds with how much chlorophyll is in the leaf. And to me, that's a direct relationship to how much nitrogen in this can be used by that plant. And that's how we guess it. If this reads 42 parts per million, we can grow 200 bushel corn. If it's 41 parts per million, we grow 150 bushel corn. So we need to put some nitrogen with it. That's how touchy that scale is. We also use the Savita test. I really like this. Uh, Jay talked about carbon dioxide leaving the soil, and that's what this test does. You put that jar half full of soil. You put this flag in it right here. 24 hours later, you take the lid off and see what the chart says. If it's three or higher, it says you need no nitrogen. I got lazy. I didn't want to dig the soil, so I just take and shove the flag in the soil, take the jar, shove it in the ground two inches deep, go back in the morning, take it off, and see what the flag says. <laughs> Works just as well, you know. It's more accurate that way than actually digging the dirt, because when you dig the dirt, you will lose some carbon dioxide, you know. How do we introduce covers? Well, you saw my drill. This happens to be a wore out hay field. And we're introducing two pound of radishes without a herbicide. I must tell you that probably only one pound of the radish grow, but we get one every four or five inches, which loosens the soil, takes the compaction out of the hay wagons and the hay rake and the hay bind and all that crap. And we can produce a pretty nice crop of corn. This is my new, my new seeding, cedar. That's why my wife's not here. She's still pissed at me, you know? <laughs> I didn't tell her till she saw it in the shed. And you don't ever do that, guys. Let me tell you, don't make that same mistake. Just tell them ahead of time. They'll get over it eventually, <laughs> I hope. But anyhow, this was a high boy sprayer. We took the wet tank off of it. We took the wet boom off of it. This is a uh, air seeder. It holds about uh, 6,000 pounds of seed. This is a 90-foot boom. We got drops every 30 inches. This machine will go through cover crop as tall as a cab, not knock it over other than on the end rows, and sow cover crop seed. We can blow 20 different species up to 75 pounds per acre. Now, we don't sow it that thick, but that's how, how what it can do. You probably can't see it, but right there is a cover crop seed coming out of this machine. This fall it was a whole lot easier because the first year this machine didn't have guidance. You know, so what you did, you set your in between the steering column, you looked at that white tube, and you couldn't see right or left because the corn was taller than the cab, and you just hope you didn't hit a hole. Because if you looked right or left, you took out 500 foot of corn. <laughs> you know. I would a lot rather, and, I, and we have done it this year, and it's working really nice, and I'll show you some pictures of it here in just a second, where we're blowing our cover crop in when the corn's are between waist and chest high. Guess what? You can see where you're going. You know, instead of running two mile an hour, we can run six or eight, you know? I think we need to be putting it on earlier, you know, and I'll show you why here in just a second. Here it is that we blew in standing corn, Look at the cover. This is peas and radishes and uh, some hairy vetch and crimson clover getting ready to go back to corn. I'm getting greedy. You never have done corn back to corn, but I thought, man, you know, if I can get all the nitrogen I need 
and grow a high value crop. Of course, it's only worth two bucks now, so it's not a high value crop anymore. But, you know, someday it'll come back. Here it is in soybeans. That's the wheel track of the high boy right there. Over here's another one. You know? What did those beans yield? These beans yielded about 52 bushel. You know? And when did you put the cover crop on? Uh, we blew the cover crop on at first yellow leaf in the beans. Now, the disadvantage of that was this fall, we had a wet fall. The beans stayed green. The cover crop was about seven and a half inches tall. Do I need to say any more? It was a bitch on that cutter bar. You know, if it was two o'clock till five o'clock, no sweat. After five o'clock, it would just wad in there and you just quit, you know. But those are the things you learn, you know. We was probably two weeks too early on the cover crop if you have a wet fall. If you have a dry fall, it would have been fine. This is six different clovers blowed into corn that was waist high, and this is the day after harvest on 11-15. We took this soil sample, sent it to Rick Haney. Jay says 80 is a good number. This was 93, Savita. He said in his letter to me, David, there's 360 pounds of nitrogen. I think he's wrong. I think there's 160, but I'm still all right. But this is what we can do. Just think, there's no more erosion. We no longer have to worry about phosphorus in our streams. We no longer have to listen to the news media telling us it's a farmer's fault that we have algae in Lake Erie or algae in the rivers. And that's an interesting point. In 1971, the Ohio State University told me that phosphorus wouldn't move, David, and you'll have to take a soil sample every inch for the next 50 years to find out where your nutrient levels are. For some reason, phosphorus must have changed its chemical compound because now it's causing pollution problems. Then we went to 12-way blend seven years, eight years ago. These are eights, tens, twelves blend. These are different things. Really don't be concerned. Just look at the plot information. No, we're going to refer to plot one, two, three, and four. 16,000 to 11,000 pounds of biomass at planting time. What we found was that we had 16,000 or higher, we could change our organic reading in the soil by as much as three quarters of 1%. If we get to 22,000 pounds of biomass at planting time, we can change it one full percentage point a year. And we've done it for four years running. We took a 1% farm, it now has 5%, and we farmed it five years. Here's the blends. Sunflowers, soybeans, uh, millet, uh, radishes, whatever you got that left over that's in the barn in the corner that you haven't used for a while, throw it in there. You know, eventually we'll figure out what it should be. But what we're after here is diversity. You know, it looks real good. Here it is in October. The only reason I'm standing there is I don't have any black cattle. And we will have some cattle some of these days, you know. But look at this. This much growth since August the 5th. Again, these are different plots. These are 500 foot wide plots. These are all different covers. This is a 50 acre field. We plant the corn across the plots. We have seven plots there with seven different species, or seven different blends from 12 way to six. Yes. Uh, three of the plots were 100% winter kill. Four of the plots had 40% winter kill. The interesting thing was our yield monitor would tell us which one did the best. Hopefully the yield monitor was right. You know, it must have been because that's what we sold it to, that's what we got paid for. This is millet, you know, this is, you guys are used to millets. Uh, this is sun hemp, sunflowers, cow peas. And what we're trying to do here is get diversity. We want warm season grasses, warm season legumes, cool season grasses, cool season legumes. So in case we have a year like we had this year, where it never got above 80 degrees and it rained every damn day, you know, that our cool season stuff would grow. 
Our warm season stuff didn't amount to nothing. I mean, it was about two and a half foot tall, and that was it. It just didn't have enough heat. You know? But we still had diversity. I guess I'd like to say I'm mimicking Mother Nature. Visualize those trees back there, or a woodlot, and now we've got the woodlot here, other than it's just something that will freeze off. You know. This is a winter, a bunch of winter annuals. This is uh, uh, Ethiopian cabbage, uh, rape seeds, uh, clovers, hairy vetch, uh, Mediterranean clover on 1222 of 11. Can you imagine how many cattle you could walk across there and feed and then still plant corn? My good friend Ray Archuleta, he's supposed to be the soil guru for the nation. He talked me into doing this, you know. He says, David, what you need is this sedan sorghum with pearl millets and all this stuff, and you plant it, and in 2012 was the hottest year we had, and we only had eight point inches of rainfall for the whole year. In 2014, we had 50 inches of rainfall, so I don't know what we have in, when a normal year is, but anyhow, I'm standing out here, the dog's right there, and I'm on the phone talking to Ray, asking him, how am I going to plant corn in this mess, and what did you get me into? You know, I'm not a government employee who's got money sticking out my ears, <laughs> you know. So he said, just hang on, David. He says, I'll come up and see you, and he never did. <coughs> he knew I was going to kill him. But anyhow, this is the stream. has 4,000 acres of no-till and cover crop right here. The junction of the stream, this has got 2,200 acres of conventional tillage. This is after a quarter inch rainfall two hours before this picture was taken. Which side of this stream do you want to live on, fellas, gals? I mean, that's what I was impressed with. Look how clean that water is up here. Some studies we've done with Ohio State University. The red bar on all three of these graphs you'll see is no-till corn only, without cover. The other bars, these are all different cover crop blends. This is the amount of nitrogen we found in the cornfield in August the 5th of 2012, where we only had 8.8 inches of rain. This is 2 inches deep, this is 10 inches deep. This represents about 85 or 90 pounds in the soil. This represents about 50 pounds of soil, 10 inches deep. Still had nitrogen available to the corn plant a lot more than where we had applied, bought in at the rate of 200 pounds per acre. <coughs> this is the one I really wanted to show you. Here's our no-till corn with no cover. These are cover crops. All I hear when I go to Texas or Oklahoma and other places that I won't mention is the cover crops take all the moisture you can't grow no crop after it. We had 14, 15, about 16 percent more moisture two inches deep on August the 2nd. At, 20 in, at 10 inches deep, we had 23% more moisture. Interesting fact, 174 bushel corn, 164, 124, 117, and 85. And this is porosity, that's just how loose the soil is, and it shows that the cover crops are loose in the soil, which will make more water go in will infiltrate the soil. I was in Pennsylvania in 13 talking, thought, thought these guys, I thought I was as smarter than these guys were. I was talking about all dairymen, didn't realize that. I know they asked me to come, we went to this farm, it was up on a big old hill, the house and the barn and stuff was down at the bottom and he says, David you're supposed to talk up on top of that hill and I walked, looked up there and I says, I gotta walk up there? <laughs> well yeah, you know, so we I gradually crawled up there, you know, it was a tall old hill. Got up there, and this is a mess I saw, you know, and I, he says, going to talk about this. I said, okay, I don't know what to say. I says, cover crop and corn growing together looks pretty good. What do you do this for? Well, we found David three years ago, we did this, that we got two ton more silage per acre. Milk production went up 12% as soon as the cows hit that in the silo. He says, that's a practice we're doing now. And there was a whole bunch of them doing it, you know. 
So to me, the cover crop didn't hurt the corn if it's going to silage. Uh, just some other, these using, they use soybeans, they use a lot of different things to prove the fact. You saw that picture, and I'm not going to take this away from our speaker this afternoon, but cover crops will really work good. What I want to bring to you is that's somewhere around 50,000 pounds of beef per acre, somewhere in that category. There is more living organism underneath those cattle than you can put on top of the soil. That's why we have to feed the microorganisms in the soil. You know, Jay did a nice job talking about it. You know, I'd like to have that young man with the black shirt stand up a second. If you'll stand up. You know, there's my conventional neighbor's farm with his microbes and organisms that's being fed 70 days a year. You know, they just aren't eating enough. When you look at somebody that's fed 365 days a year, there's a difference. Now, which one would you like to be? Thank you. You know, I mean, I, I like visual signs, and I thought that was a good visual sign to let you know how fat my microbes and organisms are in the soil. And there's something to it, guys. I'm not able to explain it. I just know it works, and I'm glad it does for me, you know? A few more pictures. Love to have some of those cows today, you know? $2.50 a pound for feeder calves. The secret we got to do, and we got to convince everybody, when the field looks like this, you get them off of it. Now, I was, a, I was a beef cattleman. I was a dairyman before that. And if it wasn't brown when them cattle left, they didn't eat enough of it. But I've learned a different lesson. You know? You can come back and get that in 30 days or 40 days once it grows back. Take a half of that again, you know? That's a million pounds of beef, you know. What I wanted to show you was, and don't think, you know, this really irritated me. I was on the internet a couple months ago, and this happens to be one of our fields. I had Google, Google Map, and, and I was giving a little directions, and this field come up on Google Map. And this is a feed field we had this summer. If you'll notice, there's, there's different colored wheat, you know. And I sat there and looked at that, and I thought, man, if the government's, why are they asking us what we're doing when they know what we're doing? You know? But anyhow, this was cover crops from that slide previous before I showed you we had all them blends in, before we planted corn. This is three years after the cover crop was there. So what I did, I got my yield map out from the combine when we cut the wheat. The wheat averaged 94 bushel off that field this year. Wheat did really well in Ohio. That piece right there made 125. That one was 135, that one was 94, that one was 102, and this was 85. Three years later, we still had an effect of having a cover crop in three years prior to that, which was hard for me to believe. So we're doing something by only introducing a cover once every three years. If we could do it every year, just think what we could do. You know, that's the goal. Here's that field that we had those covers in it. There's our peas and radishes. If you look at the blue bar on all these instances, blue bar was 100% of the fertilizer needed to produce 200 bushel corn. I didn't know he was only going to have 8.8 .8 inches of rain in 2012, or I wouldn't use that much. But I thought I could get, to get it up where it belonged. The red bar is just, when we planted those plots, we just cut everything in half. It's just a lot easier. You got an eight's two sprocket, you change it to a four. That cuts the seeding rate, those rates in half. And the green bar is absolutely nothing but seed corn put in a box and planted. You know? And in 2012, one year study, our three big blends produced 175 bushel corn. And we produced about 160 bushel corn with all the fertilizer needed. In 2014, at 125 acres of corn with no herbicide, no starter fertilizer, and no nitrogen, average 165. I had 200 acres of no-till corn after soybeans, 
with all the conventional fertilizer, all the conventional herbicides, and all the conventional nitrogen, and it averaged 159. It really paid me to put all that nutrients on that corn, you know. But it was just a head first year, you know. Interesting thing, after we took that plot off, we pulled soil samples, sent them to Rick Haney. So for 2013, this was the amount of nutrients we had for growing soybeans. Blend one, we had $273.88 worth of nutrients left in that plot. Cover crops will bring up some nutrients. I can't tell you how much they're going to bring up, because nobody knows how they're going to grow. But we need to learn to reduce what we're putting on if we're using cover crops. That's all I'm telling you. You don't have to eliminate it, but you can reduce it. You know? And why spend 30 to 40 bucks an acre and not reduce your inputs? Unless the government's giving you 85 to plant it. You know? In our case, we always had to reduce our nutrients to cover the cost of the cover crop seed that we were using. We didn't have subsidy. What did this mean as far as nutrient density in our crop? Now, whoever would have thought about nutrient density? Because when I go to ADM, it don't matter whether it's green or yellow, if it looks like corn, they pay you so much. No fertilizer, 9% protein. Half rate fertilizer, 8.6. Full rate fertilizer, 7.5. Today, all of our corn that we have cover crop on go to a hog farmer, and this figure changed to 57 cents this year instead of 27. And 57 cents on $3 corn make a hell of a lot of difference. So there is some value in improving your soil health to improve the quality of grain. If you do this, I suggest you get somebody to test the grain to see where you're at. That's the field that we saw the yield plot in. This is all, and this is the soybeans, a year after cover crop with no nutrients put on, and it averaged 61 bushel. I wish I could get all my beans to yield like they did right up through there. I don't know what the hell happened there, but that was peas and radishes. And if you look at the yield chart, it was from 80 to 145. It had to be 80, it wasn't 145, but look at the yield right there. How do we terminate our crops? We use a crop roller. This is what it looks like. Remember, if you're going to roll a high crop, you must plant it the same way you roll it. <laughs> Write this down. Don't ever plant against the way you roll. That's a six-hour job of cleaning out the corn planter. I know. Don't do it. You know? Look how nice that is. Look at the residue. Once that dies, do you think weeds are coming through that? No way. Uh, this is the best way roller. You can see it's kind of rolling down the rye. The problem with this rye was it wasn't tall enough. It's springing up and down. A little bit, and I hope this will work. It hasn't worked yet in the presentation, so why should it work now? But I guess it's not going to. All right. It's, it was a roller, it's going to roll, and then they had a couple others. But I really like a chevron type roller. It actually crimps the commodity every four inches, and that way it'll die. The biggest thing I have problems with is when you roll rye like this, it may take it three weeks to turn brown. When you put Roundup or Cremoxone on it, it's brown in four days. Do you need it? I don't know. If it makes you feel better, put it out there. You know? But we've learned it just, just takes a while. And when you roll a crop that's that thick, there is no weeds coming through it. Because it ends up, when you brush cut it, you'll have wind rows of stuff, and then you'll have problems with it getting up. I throw this picture in. This happens to be a John Deere haybine with a uh, center pivot. The guy's real inventive. He had an anhydrous tank that had a hole rusted in it. So that's an anhydrous tank with everything cut off of it and they filled it up full of concrete. And that's his crop roller and all he does is take the turnbuckles loose, puts his hay bind back on there and then mows hay with it after he does that, you know. I thought that was pretty ingenious, you know. Just to show you that you can think outside the norm. Uh, here we're planting cover. This is what's left after a 12-week cover. I don't suppose this one will work either. Yep. We were going to show you how nice it is to plant into it. But that's the residue left. 
after uh, a winter kill. Ryegrass, I like it. It's a deep-rooted plant. We quit using it because it's hard to kill. It's just hard to kill for us. We let it get too big. Enough said about that one. Uh, flash grow? Huh? Flash, could you flash graze that ryegrass, keep them from getting so big? Uh, yeah, you might. You might. Uh, this is crimson clover in the ryegrass. If you'll notice, uh, these little steeples here, crimson clover rather than a bulb, it has a steeple. Got six grandkids. They really love it in the spring. I give them a pair of scissors, send them out there. I tell them to put 15 of these in a handful of clover rubber band around it. They take it to a floor department. They pay them $10 a bundle. Kids come home with five or 600 bucks. Grandpa gives them the money. They think grandpa's all right, you know. So if you want to make your kids feel good, find them something to do. Again, just uh, this is uh, this is in North Carolina. This is Ray Stires. This is his mix: uh, rye, crimson clover, hairy vetch, and reddishes. Now, and he's done this for nine years and not used a fertilizer or insecticide, and takes corn silage off every year. Continuous corn silage. Here we're planting into rye. When a rye is this tall. It is really tough to kill because it's in the boot stage. You know, if you kill it earlier, it's not a problem. But then you lose out not having something green and growing there. Iowa, Indiana, uh, Illinois, they're planting rye grass. They're killing it the first of April. It's about four inches tall. I guess that's better than nothing. But to me, you got another month, you could have had something growing to help replace and feed them organisms. They're getting hungry if they haven't ate for 30 days, you know, underneath the soil. There's what it looks like when you plant into it. Don't look all the best. There's the corn coming. But here it is a month later, looking a lot better. Uh, this is that 12-way blend that I was standing into. You saw the dog in. This is 12 to 22. What I wanted to show you was we have green undergrowth here, just like in the woods. You have green trees in the wintertime. So we're feeding the microbes and organisms, all the things in the soil. You know, eventually they'll die. Uh, here, here it is again on October. Here's the 22nd. This is 12 inches thick. This is 27,000 pounds of biomass on the surface. Can you do the math? That's 13 ton. It's six to eight inches thick. But there's the results. The planter will run through it. We don't use row cleaners. We don't use cast iron closing wheels. We use a eight wavy and we're, we're changing it to a 25 wavy colder because it'll make the particle size smaller, cut the residue a little better. But nothing great on the planter. Not saying you don't need it. I just know that we had row cleaners on. It made the nicest round bales out of stuff you ever saw. You know. If we was corn on corn with no cover crop, I'd have row cleaners. We don't have that. So we don't use them. If anybody needs them, I got 200 in a pile. This is another shot of it. Kind of wanted to show you this. This is 2012. This is landmark 6925 corn. Belongs to my neighbor. There's a 20-foot blacktop road, conventional tilled. All the herbicide, all the nitrogen that you can put on there for 175, 80 bushel corn. This is across the road the same day. Eight different species of cover. You see that? It says 7-Eleven. I think that one says, I think it says the same thing on the other one. Maybe it doesn't say anything. Yeah, there it is, 7-Eleven. Neat thing about this was, made 42 bushel corn. He got a hell of a crop insurance payment. This corn made 165, no crop insurance payment, which is okay with me. Something else we're trying, this is Ray Archuleta, Inter interplanting soybeans with the corn. There they are. Does it work? You answer the question. Does it work? Top four varieties. Soybeans, no starter fertilizer, no nitrogen. Bottom four, same varieties. Move 20 foot down in the plot of the FFA field and look at the yield difference. 57 bushel yield difference. So far, we've not been able to replicate this this good since then. This was 2012. 
In, in 13, there was 20 bushel difference. In 14, it was the opposite. The fertilizer did better than the soybeans by a bushel. But a bushel of, bean, a bushel of corn does not pay for the nitrogen in the starter fertilizer. Some things I like to talk to you about, and sometimes we overlook these. You know, we know what it costs to put out an acre of corn. I could ask everybody here today, and you can tell me exactly what you're going to have in, in 2015 corn crop. But you never tell me what your fixed costs are. And I think it's real easy to figure your fixed cost. If you look at your 1040F farm form that you filed last year for your federal taxes, you take the seed, the fertilizer, the herbicide, the insecticide, and the lime out of that, that equation. Because I think those are your variable cost things. Everything else is fixed. You know, if you got living expense in there and you don't have somebody working off the farm, the farm has to pay for it. So whatever that figure is, divide it by the acres that you farm, and that's what we did here. Every morning before I get up, that's like this morning when I got up in a nice hotel room here, it cost me $186.15. You know, that's my fixed cost. Now when we go to looking at no-till crops, and this is the neighbor's field again, there's, there's these windrows. My agronomist said in order for him to have 150 bushel corn, this is what he needed to put on. You all can read, but down here's the figure you want to look at. He's got $444 in his variable cost. Now you may argue whether it takes all that or not, but that's what the agronomist said to do. 90% of the people's listen to their agronomist. If you put the fixed cost on there, this is what it was. In 2012, it made 120 bushel an acre, and we got five, it cost $5.25 a bushel with all the costs in your farming operation. Wasn't a bad deal because he sold that corn for eight bucks. This fall he sold the corn for $2.75 and still has the $5 in it. Any argument? I mean, we know that there's not going to be a margin in corn. You know, we know that going in. Here's the peas and radishes. We got a little bit of nitrogen figured in. We got a one shot of herbicide just because we don't have the biomass on the surface to control the weeds. We got a little bit of starter fertilizer, not as much as we'd put on if, if we had no cover. And we got uh, 200 or $423 in everything or $2.90. I could make a dime. I'm still making money. I'm not going to buy a new pickup truck at $3 corn. Here's a real one. We got $335. Dollar ninety-two, dollar ninety-four, rather, and we're doing it on two point four gallon of diesel fuel. When we put cover crop in a situation, it takes less fuel. If you put rye on your corn fodder ground and plant soybeans, you'll reduce your fuel charge of your combine by as much as thirty percent. Mainly because the header push is easier and the combine's not sinking in the soil. It's right on the residue. That's the net savings. Doesn't matter how you want to roll it. This is our garden plots. Here we're rolling rye for our garden. Here's our tomato. My wife does this, you can tell, I don't bend over. You know. Uh, she takes a little trowel spade, just spreads the rye apart, sticks a tomato in there. That happens to be a drip tape. That was three years in 2009. We no longer use a drip tape. We've never had to use it, so we don't put it out there anymore. Here's what they look like. You see how thick this residue is on the surface, or this thatch. When it rains, we do not have the soil splicing up on a tomato plant. We do not have, we do not have uh, uh, mold problems with the tomatoes. Those plants produce 20 pounds more tomatoes than on their cultured plastic. It's a win-win. Everybody likes to talk about precision planters. And this has to be my precision planter. You know, Kenzie's got theirs, John Deere's got theirs. They can run 10 mile an hour now. But anyhow, we built this thing, and there's a fluted colder, there's a seed colder, there's a closing wheel, there's my weight transfer. Works pretty well, you know. 
put a seat on there where the seat box would have went. We got a tube going down here with a funnel, and in his right hand, he's got his pumpkin seeds. The left hand, he's got a quarter fistful of fertilizer. So when that red mark comes up on that tire, which is a precision mark, you know, he throws two pumpkin seeds in the funnel, quarter full of fertilizer, and we're off and running. This is 100-year-old sod fescue, whatever you want to call it, around this barn. Why do we do that? That belongs to the state wool growers, the nine-acre piece. The taxes on that nine acres was $10,650. The wool growers called me and says, what can you do with it? I says, I don't know. We got to get it into agriculture use. So we planted it full of pumpkins, got it to agriculture use. Taxes went to $2,400. They love me. And this is the result. There's the pumpkins. You know, here they are, there's my lovely wife. Look at these pumpkins, you know. No disease, no <coughs> other than that quarter fistful of fertilizer, which probably didn't equal more than a five gallon bucket on the seven acres, which is about 50 pounds. You know, the neat thing is, right back here is what we're after. Five years ago, we farmed that. That now has 575 homes right there. Right there's the gate. Guess what? You get a bale of straw and put your bib overhauls on. <laughs> and you let them pick them. You let them pick them. You know. And this is a $17 pumpkin. See that white one? That's a $35 pumpkin. You know. Whatever they'll bear. You know. And I get to take my wife out for supper. You know, we got enough left. You know, there they are, guys. Just you know, if, if you got populations you're fighting, you can do it. If you if you're out here in the countryside and you only got one house and ten thousand feet, you're not going to do any good. But you have to think out. I'm just trying to t teach you to think outside the norm. If you're a corn and bean guy, think just a little further. Make that step of courage. Try some cover crop. There's incentive plans to do it. You know, uh, everybody's talked about Gabe Brown. Gabe was at our farm. He gave me all kinds of Hector. We had tomato, potato plants that was four foot tall, nice big ridges, dark soil that we'd cultivated. And he says, David, he took my wife over there and put his arm. I thought he was making love to her at first. You know, I didn't know what he was doing. But he was trying to tell her that she had to quit doing that. He says, you just take the tomato plant or potato plants, put them in the corner of the yard where you mowed the yard, Roll out an old rotten round bale on it and see what happens. Well, she says, we're going to do that. So there's the, there's the tomatoes. Look at her potatoes. There is no disease, no insects, beneficials down underneath there everywhere. And here they are. They're blooming. Guess what we figured out? You could part that straw, pick them red potatoes off there, cover back up, and they put more on. And they grew clear into December. So you can do no-till potatoes. So you can have fun, too. And I appreciate your time. And thank you for inviting me here.